All right, we're gonna make this intro very quick because we have a 10 step process for building user personas based on literary archetypes going into this video. And the reason we're going to focus on it in that specific way is because it does help you identify when stereotypes could be introduced into your persona process, which is important for us to avoid at all costs. So make sure you watch the whole video. There is a uh, Amazon gift card giveaway in the middle of, of the video. And then at the very end, we're gonna talk about the task. So with that, let's head on over. This is where I get a little crazy and a little different than what other people do, is pick a fictional character. And somebody that you can identify already have a problem like you are trying to solve for or that might have that problem based on their characteristics from that book. Now the reason I use fictional characters, not just a fictional person, is because first they do make it fun and interesting. It is um, a caricature by nature so you don't really have to worry about your own biases or your teen's biases creeping in. They are just what the author has come up with and it's in popular press. Let's get into the archetypes. So we already have a fictional character and they might already have an archetype associated with them. But one thing that's very clear from the research is having multiple pictures of your fictional persona actually decreases your chance of adding in stereotypes. And I'm gonna link an article below that's kind of talking about that. So here you're going to see the broad level archetypes that you can choose from. This certainly is not the only way to do this. There are lots of different lists of archetypes. The reason you wanna use an archetype, again, is because it's familiar. It's, it's a character in a story that we are all familiar with. And that, again, gets at resonance. Resonance is such a critical part of information architecture. Is the data, is the story that data is uh, telling the user, is, is it resonating with them? Because if it's not, it's not gonna make sense and they're not going to care. All right, so building the persona archetype. That's where we're gonna camp on this slide for just a little bit. So you'll notice, just like I had mentioned, we have three images of the archetype that we are going for here. We're going to go through the traditional personas and then we're gonna talk about which ones you can probably throw out the window or things that, if you're not going to throw them out the window, that you at least pause on those steps of the persona building and make sure that you're not introducing stereotypes. Okay, so the first is persona group. What main archetype do these personas, remember these three people, uh, are they representing? So remember the last slide, those archetypes, you can pick up to three, right? So that's kind of where this uh, would be documented. The next is their name. I literally just take from the fictional characters, I just take the first initial of all of their names, remember I'm picking up to three, and I make that their name. And the reason for that is as much as you wanna call the person Sandra or Dan or whatever, in most companies, you're going to shorten it to an acronym. Come on, put it in the comments below. Do you agree with me here? All right, so here's the first one that I don't agree with. Job title and major responsibilities. Now this one might be a little controversial. So having a job title could be a buyer persona or the difference between um, a traditional user or their parent, perhaps. Honestly, if you are capturing the user's main intent, their main behavior pattern, on your site and what um, problem they're trying to solve, you don't need to know their title. Let's go to the buyer persona. If this person is a buyer, well, their intent is to purchase something. So you don't really need to talk about their title or their responsibilities. Besides, job titles are incredibly difficult to get right. So it's honestly a mostly useless area, at least in a persona. All right, so demographics. This is another one that I just think it doesn't belong. And again, it's not because these elements are not important to capture. It's if you're doing the intent, the problems, and the um, usage pattern, you don't necessarily need to know what their age is. That could introduce ageism. Their education level, there's all kinds of problems with that. Somebody could be completely self-taught and be incredibly brilliant. 
Um, ethnicity, again, you know, I think that we should be inclusive. Um, and then family status, again, you know, if your intent, and I'm gonna say it over and over again, if your intent and your problem statement and your user behavior all are, are fleshed out well, you don't need to know if they're married or divorced, if they're on a singles website, guess what? They could be having an affair. You don't need to know that. You just need to know they're finding someone to love. Okay, again, these all could be controversial. These are my own opinions and what I have found to work well. Again, trying to limit stereotypes. If you continue to use some of these steps in your persona, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just an area to keep in mind so that you don't introduce problems. So the intent and problem they are trying to solve, this is really important. This is really important. What is their intent? And what are the problems that they're trying to um, get, get rid of or solve? Physical, social, and technological environment. You don't really need that. Level of familiarity with the domain and intent. This is one that I've added. So this is how familiar are they with types of sites such as yours. So if they are used to going to academic conferences, they will know how to use those kind of sites. But it is good to at least identify whether your interface is for people that have a lot of familiarity or not a lot of familiarity and for which domains. Okay, the next one, again, I don't understand why this would be something to add. A quote that sums up what matters most to the persona. I think people are very complex and I think that this is just silly and you don't need to have it. By the way, this original traditional list is from usability.gov. It's certainly not the only list. I'm sure there are others out there that um, have different um, pieces to it, but I will say they all have a lot in common. So this is the one that I selected for this, this video. Next one, um, casual pictures representing the user group. Now you'll notice I did use images, but I didn't use it from a real person. You know, there's, there's stock images that you can get for this kind of behavior. I use fictional characters again, because it, it, it immediately connects that character to an archetype. And again, there is research saying don't use one, but multiple. This is to make sure that when somebody is looking at this persona, that they, they have that maybe stereotypical thing broken up visually because they're seeing multiple people being represented. All right, and then this is the one that I added. Add more than one fictional character picture to flesh out the archetype, and that's really to uh, supplement the number nine that we have taken out. Okay, so now we have a, a working persona. Are we done? No, we are not. All right, oh, and the main usage pattern, I forgot about that one. Okay, so now what you need to do is present this to real people, real users to refine those patterns. So because you used archetypes instead, they will be able to resonate with that user. They will be able to put themselves in that user persona's shoes to really help you understand if that pattern is accurate or not. And remember, we're doing this to significance. Do you have a significant feedback to move forward with the persona that you have? and for the pattern. So you should have one persona per pattern that you've identified. Okay, so we're getting to the end, guys. Identify if and which data will support that pattern. So now we're really getting into that information architecture phase. Up until this point, you could have a user group that's already doing this for you or somebody else at your company that's doing this for you. Whatever the case is, you still need to understand those pieces and those processes because the user experience team that you work with might not be thinking about the areas where they could be introducing stereotypes. Here is where you have to start to think through what is that pattern. You got the user persona, you have all this data. Now you're looking at the pattern and trying to make sure that you have the data to support that pattern. So for instance, if one of those patterns is somebody does a search for um, news articles, they want the newest stuff at the very top. If for some reason your date information on your metadata is not correct or not well structured, meaning some of them say February, some of them say 02, some of them say the, the day of the month before the month, if all of those are different, you're going to have a very hard time giving the user a filter or 
even raising the most recent articles to the top of the search results if you don't have the right data to support that. Okay, and now here's the part where you are probably the most excited about, which is now you think you have the data, you have your hypothesis, you have enough data to support the hypothesis. Now go out and test it. Go find some people, you know, hopefully that pilot group that you were talking to in step three is still willing to work with you and rinse and repeat. This will take some time and make sure that you don't introduce too many changes in any given sample because then you're going to muddy the results that you're getting back. This week's task is going to look like this over here. And what you're going to do is you're going to list out this criteria and you're going to use the site, the Tate, which is a museum site to create that user persona and put that persona in the comments below. And I will go in and I will check it and I will comment it on it. And overall we'll have a great conversation, I hope. And so with that, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And next week we are going to go bananas over metadata. All right. So I'll check you out next time.